we normally do these as Congress on your corner. And today, I guess it's going to be Congress in your kitchen or your front porch or your living room or wherever you may be socially distancing uh, today. Uh, I, uh, uh, I am in my kitchen, in my, in my home in Ringo's. Um, so it's, it's all Hunterdon County on this call today. And bear with us because this is the first one of these that we have done um, by, by Zoom, by video conference. Um, we've done district-wide teletown halls on telephone. So we're gonna try this new format and, and hopefully it will, uh, it'll feel a little bit more personal than, um, than just having everybody on the phone. Um, so so I've, been, I've been home as, as I assume most of you have been uh, now for some time. And there are days when it feels frustrating. There are days when it feels very isolating. And I imagine many of you have some of those same feelings. But even though we may be physically isolated, uh, I want everybody to remember that um, this experience actually makes us part of a community um, because we are all together in this. We are all engaged together in one of the greatest collective community enterprises that the people of our country have ever engaged in. It's a bit strange, it's a bit different from anything we've experienced, but it is something we are all doing together and we're doing it for a very good reason. It may feel like inaction, but it's actually action. Action to save people's lives, action to help our first responders, uh, our hospital personnel, our doctors and nurses to be able to do their job to minimize their burden so that we can get through this more quickly. So first, I just want to thank everybody um, for whatever sacrifices you are making right now to make sure that we, we come together and, and beat this epidemic and get this country back to where it needs to be. And I'm confident based on the evidence that I have seen, as hard as this is right now, as hard as the next two weeks especially will be, that we are going to do it. Now, in Congress, our main responsibility has been, well, number one, empowering public health and medical professionals, giving them the resources they need to do their jobs and the authority that they need to do their jobs, trusting their advice as we all need to do now. And number two, making it economically possible for all of us, for ordinary Americans to follow the public health advice. We're asking small businesses and businesses to shut their doors. We're asking employees to stay home. We need to make sure that that is economically possible for everybody. And so that's what we've been in Congress. Um, I think you know the, the top lines. The last bill, the CARES Act, was the biggest and most ambitious. It was designed to try to stabilize, not really to stimulate, but to stabilize the economy, um, to kind of put our country in a giant timeout that we can all survive until we can come out of our homes, uh, hopefully in the next few weeks. Um, and there's a lot in that bill that's gonna help uh, all of us. The most important principle behind it, in my opinion, is that we want to retain their employees, to stay whole. That's why the centerpiece of the bill was this paycheck protection program, loans to small businesses that are fully 100% forgivable if those businesses retain their employees. And, and businesses in our uh, communities are applying for those loans right now. It's a little bit overwhelming. I'm sure there'll be questions about that, but we will get through it. We enhanced unemployment compensation on top of that will be, there'll be, uh, uh, payments of $1,200 to every individual ma who made uh, for kids. Um, there'll be a tremendous amount of money going into our hospital system uh, to shore it up. Um, there'll be grants for, uh, for farmers. There'll be grants for uh, first responders to buy PPE, a whole range of, uh, of programs that are going to make a difference in our community. Now, um, we got a bunch of questions from you guys in advance, 
And there was one set of questions for, uh, to get to first. And okay, this is funny, I'm home and my propane delivery is just knocked on my front door. I have to open it. Will you give me one minute? <laughs> Hold on. Thank you again, everyone, for joining. Just a friendly reminder, um, if you do have a question that you would like to ask, um, please um, use the chat feature at the bottom of the screen to myself and we'll add your question to the queue. Again, if we don't have time to, if we don't get time to get to your question here on the call, well, we will have our staff reach out um, and answer that question for you if possible. So please include all your information, such as email and phone number. Thank you. I'm back. Hi, real life. <laughs> um, okay, so um, what I was getting, just getting to, that we got a bunch of questions um, about uh, a story that's been spreading on social media um, regarding uh, whether our rural counties, including Hunterdon County, are somehow being locked out of assistance under the CARES Act, under the legislation that we passed. So I wanted to get, get to that up front because we got a whole bunch of, um, of questions on it. And the most important thing is it's not true. The, the programs that are going to benefit the vast majority of, uh, of us, of our friends, our neighbors, our small businesses, the forgivable loans, the unemployment compensation, the grants to hospitals, to first responders, um, all of that stuff and more is equally available to everybody in the country, everybody in our state, everybody in Hunterdon County. Folks are applying right now at community banks all over the county for the small business loans. All that is coming to us. Now, how did the story spread? Based on an article that appeared in uh, the Star-Ledger a couple of days ago, which described the distribution of money from one fed federal program called the Community Development Block Grant, which is a long-standing federal housing assistance program um, that helps um, communities that have federally subsidized housing. Um, and in the bill, in the CARES Act, we added about $5 billion to this program. Um, and so NJ.com ran a story and it showed, here are the counties in New Jersey that are benefiting from it. And if you look at that list, Hunterdon County is not on there, Warren County is not on there, Sussex is not on there. The re reason for that is because this program, by law, by longstanding law, only gives grants to urban counties and to cities with a population over $50,000, which makes sense because these are basically housing grants, urban development grants. Hunterdon County's never gotten any money from that program. And so a bunch of folks misinterpreted that article. A few people, I think, deliberately misinterpreted it. We got some partisan stuff out there suggesting that our rural counties aren't getting a penny of this relief money, which is completely dishonest um, statement. It's only under this community development block grant. And then, in fact, if you look at the bill, there are other things that um, only people in Hunterdon County uh, and our rural counties might get because we all also have special uh, who supply farmers markets and restaurants and who may also be having a hard time right now. Folks in New York and Jersey City aren't getting any of that money, but we might in Hunterdon County um, uh, and, and so forth. Um, so, um, so I wanted to address that uh, right up front. And if there are more questions on that, I'm absolutely happy um, to, to take them when we do our Q&A. But bottom line, Hunterdon County is eligible for everything that people in the rest of the state are, with the one exception of these urban housing grants, which we don't really need anyway. Um, other things, um, I'm working very, very hard uh, with our elected officials in Hunterdon County. I was just off the phone with uh, the chair of the Freeholder Board 
um, to make sure that we are getting the resources we need from the state as well as from the federal government. Um, we need to ramp up testing for COVID-19 um, in Hunterdon County. We're working on a joint project between Hunterdon and Somerset counties to start up a drive-through testing location. Um, we are late to the game uh, in, in that respect, but there may be an advantage there in that we may be able to start with some of the newer testing technologies that work a little bit better and little neighbors in the other counties um, have been able um, to, to use. So um, that's, uh, that's a few opening remarks. I wanna get to your questions um, and we'll obviously take uh, as many questions as you have in the time available on uh, COVID-19 or any other issues that you may wanna raise with me. We will almost certainly not get to all of your questions in the live Q&A, but as you heard from DeAndre, if you leave a question with us and you leave contact information, our staff will get back to you. We will try to answer every single question, whether we have time to do it live uh, during the Zoom session or not. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to you, DeAndre, and, um, uh, and start taking questions. Thanks again. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Um, again, just a friendly reminder, if you have questions, please use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen um, and send us your questions. Please, uh, please put your name and uh, the town you are from in there, as well as an email address so if we don't get to your question on the call, we can definitely follow up with you, like the Congressman said. Tom, your first question comes from a question that was submitted beforehand. With the stimulus package, has there been any consideration to relax the salt tax uh, limitation? So uh, the, salt, uh, the salt deduction um, obviously refers to the state and local tax deduction that used to be actually through all of the history of the federal income tax part of epidemic or no epidemic. I got a bill passed in the House of Representatives from uh, last December to fully restore the SALT deduction. It got nowhere in the Senate so far, um, but we're going to keep on fighting. Um, and in the context of the COVID epidemic, um, I've been working uh, with a group of uh, my colleagues in the House to try to get a provision in our next bill, because what I described to you that we've already done is not enough. That's just a down payment. Our next bill, which we're working on right now, I have been pushing to get um, at least a partial, if not full, uh, restoration of uh, the SALT deduction in there. You guys may have heard Speaker Pelosi uh, includes on the list of items that, uh, that she and our leadership are considering for that bill. Um, I, so I expect there to be a very serious effort to do it. I expect it to be controversial. Um, but I believe it's a, it, it absolutely should be done even if, even if this horrible situation we're in was not happening. Um, the, the SALT deduction uh, is absolutely critical to middle-class taxpayers in our state and in all other states where, where voters have chosen um, to have higher than average um, state and local taxes to pay for schools and transportation and the services that we uh, enjoy and wanna keep uh, in the state of uh, New Jersey. And especially in the current context, it would be a great way to give relief to middle-income people who are hurting because of the COVID crisis. Thank you, Tom. Our next question comes from Bill, who is live on, on the screen. Bill, Congressman, Bill thank you uh, so much for holding this uh, forum. It's a real service to uh, people of the county. Uh, in another life, in about three hours, I'll be a professor on Zoom at the College of New Jersey, where I teach in the political science department. So this is a great laboratory for me to talk to my students tonight because the subject of our American government class, ironically, is Congress. But that's not the reason primarily that I'm on here. I'm on here as a resident of, of Raritan Township. So obviously, Hunterdon County isn't as dramatically as affected uh, by the, the crisis. We are, but not as 
much as certainly Bergen or Hudson counties are. So is there a likelihood that our own Hunterdon Medical Center could take uh, overflow as patients? And obviously with that being a scenario, is there a way you can help coordinate uh, possible needs for uh, volunteers? Yeah. Uh, um, so um, I have been talking to all of our hospitals uh, in, in and around my congressional district. They are talking to each other. So believe, believe me, they, they are, um, they're very much on top of the, the question that you, that you raised. If, if any of them have excess capacity, um, it's going to be used um, because the next two weeks are gonna be very hard for the state of New Jersey. If you look at the projections, we are expected to hit our peak in terms of demands for hospital beds, for ICU beds um, in that period of time. All of our hospitals, including in Hunterdon, have been um, doing everything they can to expand the number uh, of ICU beds available for COVID patients. All of them have been, uh, of course, delaying or canceling elective procedures um, so that most of their patients now um, are COVID uh, related. Um, all of them have told me that um, in some respects, their biggest challenge right now is personnel. Um, even if they can, uh, you know, open up old wings and, and convert um, regular hospital uh, rooms into, um, into the most more specialized rooms needed for these patients, they are, they've been struggling to find the, the, the skilled doctors and nurses uh, needed to run this equipment and to provide these services. Um, and so you're seeing a lot of uh, hiring uh, of folks from other parts of the country um, where th that have not yet been hit as intensely as we have been in this area. Um, they're all telling me, you know, fingers crossed, including in Hunterdon, so far so good. So far they they feel that they probably can handle this. Um, and we are doing everything we can to get them the resources they need to do that. But that's why this is where all of us come in because what we are doing right now is not stopping COVID, but it's slowing the spread of transition. So that peak that we are going to reach is not going to be quite as overwhelming to our hospital system as it might otherwise would, would be. That's why this is so critical. Um, I'm cautiously optimistic that this gargantuan effort to get them the supplies, the ventilators, the PPE, the, the, the sharing of personnel among different healthcare systems and facilities, that, that, that we will have the resources needed. Um, but it depends as much on everybody on this call as it does on um, the brave doctors and nurses and, and, and hospital administrators who are on the front lines. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Our next question comes from Joy. Joyce Leslie. I think you need to unmute yourself, Joyce. DeAndre, could you unmute okay, her? Okay, there I am. There we go. Good. I think I'm there. Yep, I hear you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, a friend contacted me with a question, and this is switching gears from the topic that you just covered. Um, she's wondering about stimulus checks and how college-age students are covered. Um, would they get a separate check? or would they be incorporated in the check to the family perhaps? Uh, so th this, is, th this is a problem that, that has been identified that college age students could be left out and we are, we are, all I can say is we're working to fix it, um, hopefully in the next package. Um, the, the, the direct payments, uh, these are $1,200 payments as, as I'm sure you all know um, to individuals, 2,400 if you're a married couple, um, 500 for minor children. Um, and you know, it's for folks basically who filed tax returns or have social security numbers. Um, and, um, 
there, there is there is a scenario here where college students um, are falling through the cracks because they're not counted as children um, for this purpose, but they're still not yet uh, uh, going to qualify for that twelve hundred dollar check. So again, we're trying to fix that. My my sense is that we're probably going to need another round of these checks anyway. Um, this may not be a one time thing, uh, given. Uh, the course that I think we are uh, we are on, um, one way or another, that's that's just something that we we have to fix. Um, the only added point I would make is that although it's nice to get twelve hundred dollars in the mail or or more likely by direct deposit, um, anyone who's in there uh, will see get it by direct deposit. Well, that's nice. The bulk of the relief though is not, it's coming through the pay, pay, Paycheck Protection Program to try to keep people on salary uh, at their business or nonprofit, whatever you work for, um, uh, and through the enhanced unemployment compensation, um, which um, adds $600 from the federal government uh, to the, the, the regular unemployment compensation that, that folks would be getting. Um, in terms of dollar amounts and sustainability, those are by far the most important parts of the relief package in my view. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Joyce. Next question comes from Leslie from Ringo. Good afternoon, Congressman. Thank you so much for having uh, this opportunity uh, to speak today. Uh, can you hear me okay? I can hear you perfectly, yes. Yeah. Sorry, my camera wasn't working, but um, <laughs> my question is, is I uh, run a nonprofit here in Hunterdon County, um, and as all this federal dollars are being pumped into the economy, which is um, honest, you know, we understand that, but we heavily rely on federal grants for prevention programs uh, to reduce substance use such as opioids as well as work on mental health. We have great concern as all these the money getting diverted probably or likely from a lot of other programs. How will we know for uh, our own staffing uh, whether prevention programs as well as other federal other program grants and such will be cut? They're not supposed to be. Um, so uh, that doesn't make your question uh, um, in any way illegitimate. Uh, it's an understandable concern, but I can tell you the money we have allocated for all those programs that uh, I mentioned, that is new money. And it's not supposed to be taken from any other federal program. And on top of that, we've made nonprofits eligible for some of the, the small business assistance. So a nonprofit basically counts as a small business. Um, with respect to say the Paycheck Protection uh, loans uh, or emergency grants that um, that small businesses can get to stay afloat, depending on your situation, obviously some nonprofits still function normally through this. But if if you can't, then you can take advantage of uh, of those programs. Uh, we are going to have very strong oversight. Uh, we're going to have an oversight committee uh, in the House uh, that will uh, that will examine with a microscope, uh, everything that the executive branch does with the money that we have uh, given them. Uh, and, uh, you know, we heard from a political science professor who's going to do a Zoom class in a moment. You can tell uh, your students that Congress is going to do Zoom hearings, uh, in part to do oversight uh, of, of these programs. And um, if, we, uh, if we see any evidence that uh, that the administration is diverting money from other needed efforts, um, such as the ones you mentioned, uh, we will be all over them. Oh, well, thank you so much. That is um, a great relief. And I'll save all my other questions for uh, the business forum that you're having tomorrow, which I just want to take a moment and say thank you so much for making yourself uh, very available during these times. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you, Leslie. And if you run into any difficulties, please let us know. Will do. Thank you. Okay. Thank you again, Leslie. Our next question comes from a question that was submitted um, when everyone was registering. Tom, 
What steps are being taken in Congress to ensure that throughout the country, every citizen has a safe and efficient way to vote in every election, especially this year? Uh, it's a very good question. It's, this is something I've been very concerned about. Um, we are seeing right now primary elections being postponed in different parts of the country. Um, we still don't know what, what will happen to the New Jersey primary uh, on June 5th. So, um, you know, when, if, when the country is on lockdown, or even if a part of the country is on lockdown, it's not going to be possible to run a normal election where people go to their, um, to the place where you usually vote and cast a ballot in person. Now, if it's a primary, that's okay. We can postpone a primary. It's no big deal. But the general election in November, that is one of the few things in our country that cannot be postponed, no matter what. We have, we have run general elections. We ran them in the Civil War. We ran them in World War II. We've never postponed a general election, and it would take an act of Congress to do it. So we have to be ready. And we know from the public health experts that it is possible that even if the, the epidemic uh, mostly goes away in the summer, it could come back in the fall. And so we have to be ready for the possibility that at least in some parts of the United States, voting in person may be hard, may be dangerous. The only solution to that is to make sure that all of those places have what we already have in New Jersey, and that is vote by mail for anybody who wants it. And so I pushed an effort in the House. We got it in the House version of this CARES Act that we just passed that would have mandated all states to do what New Jersey does, which is to give people a chance to vote by mail. And it gave them some money to make the transition. We ended up with a bill, the one we passed, that had some of the money for states that want to use it, but not the mandate, not the requirement. And we're going to have another go at this um, in the next bill. There are some people who've criticized it. Um, some of that criticism has gotten silly. Uh, we learned today that uh, one of the people who uh, votes by mail in America is President Trump. Good for him. You know, he votes in Florida, apparently, and he lives in Washington, so why not? Um, everybody in America should have the, um, the ability to do what our president does uh, and to be able to vote by mail, especially if we are in a situation in November that in any way resembles what we are going through now. Thank you, Tom. Um, your next question comes from Clark um, from Clinton Township. Clark, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you. And thank you, Representative Milanowski, for holding this uh, virtual town hall. It seems that uh, the direction of the next phase of the recovery uh, legislation has changed. It's, apparently it was initially, I thought, targeted at infrastructure spending. You mentioned about eliminating uh, the non-deductibility of state and local taxes. What are your other priorities that you anticipate being in the next phase of legislation? Sure. So um, uh, you mentioned infrastructure. Uh, that is um, our number one priority, my number one priority for the recovery phase. Right now, we're not in the recovery phase. We're still trying to manage the crisis. We're keeping the economy on life support until we can come back out of our homes. But when we get to the recovery phase, my thought, and I'm not alone in this, is let's use this moment when interest rates are basically zero to invest in what the country desperately needs anyway and that is fixing and modernizing our transportation infrastructure. We have a bill or the outlines of a bill in the house that we've already put forward that would do that. It would do tremendous good for New Jersey. Um, and, and so whether that's in the next bill, the fourth bill as we call it, uh, or the one after that, I'm not sure yet. Um, it depends on what the traffic will, will bear with the Senate, but that is absolutely our intention. Before we're done, we want to try to do a big infrastructure bill. The president um, last week tweeted out um, that 
he was interested in doing the same thing, which was a good sign because we need him. We can't do it without him. Uh, so we're going to do all the work that can be done to try to make that happen. So that's number one. Um, another big priority for me and for us is that we uh, keep our local and county governments whole. I talk to mayors and county officials every single day, and one of their big worries, understandably, doesn't matter if they're Republican or Democrat, is that taxes are going to be drying up the next month or two. The taxes that sustain our local municipal county services. And it's not their fault. Something's got to be done about that. Um, the state of New Jersey and all the states are facing similar problems. So uh, we, we did a little bit in the last bill. We, we put in a very big $150 billion fund for state and local government, but it's highly restricted. Um, local governments uh, with a population of less than 500,000 can't apply for it. Well, we don't have too many like that in Hunterdon County or anywhere in, in New Jersey. And it can't be used that money to replace lost tax revenue because of the COVID crisis. So I'm leading an effort in the House. I've introduced a bill uh, to fix that. And we are trying to work that into the next uh, COVID bill. So big priority, helping our local county uh, and state governments uh, weather uh, this, this crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you again. We will ask, our next question will come from questions that were submitted um, beforehand. Again, to everyone, if you have a question on the call, please use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. Please include your name and the town you're from and the email so we may follow up if we don't get to your question on the call. Tom, the next question is in regard to testing. Why is testing for coronavirus still a problem in this country? Well, that's, um, that's a fantastic question. Uh, we know that um, the United States and South Korea both registered their first coronavirus case on the same day in January. And somehow South Korea was able to very rapidly set up uh, a, a system where large numbers of people were tested. Once they had that, they could they could trace the contacts of the people who were tested. They could isolate those people. Uh, and uh, as a result, they flattened their curve very early and they're not shut down in the way that, uh, that we are. And so we're late to, uh, to that, uh, that game. Um, the reasons for this are probably, well, it will take too long for, for this, uh, <laughs> This conversation, and we and we we do need to investigate it. I think there's going to be a 9/11 commission-style investigation when all of this is done to understand why we lost a month or two in January and February, when the warnings warning signs were clear, the public health experts were telling us what was likely to come, and we simply did not, at the national level, commandeer the resources necessary to produce tests. Um, and the personal protective equipment needed to run those tests. Uh, and as a result, this thing got out of hand and we have closed the economy. I've often said that we are not closing the economy in America because of coronavirus. We're closing the economy because of our failure to test for coronavirus. And I think it's unconscionable. Um, locally, as I mentioned, you know, we are where we are. I've got a start where we are. Um, we have two FEMA testing centers that cover the whole state. We've got um, a, a bunch of drive-through uh, testing locations in, in, in some of our counties, but not all of them. Um, and so Somerset and Hunterdon uh, are a missing piece of that puzzle that uh, I am working with local officials to try to solve. And then I, I think we're, we are close to some breakthroughs. Um, and you know, I don't want to claim to be the expert on any of this. You shouldn't trust politicians on these kinds of questions. But what I'm told is that we are close to um, some breakthrough methodologies that will, will allow for um, uh, tests to be run uh, with instant results uh, and, um, 
uh, and produced on a larger scale. Rutgers is working on something very, very interesting right now. We're talking to them. Um, so we, we will hopefully be in a position soon to do what, country, what South Korea did. And that is the key to getting us out of our homes and back to normal. Thank you, Tom. This next question comes live from the chat as well, and I'll be reading it. There's about three questions in this one, Tom, but um, the end question will be kind of the bigger point of this. Do you agree that this lockdown can't go on indefinitely? Um, how would you balance uh, health, the health concern with the importance of keeping the economy alive? And do you see the economy opening back up over the summer? Um, you know, I, I can see the economy opening up over the summer, but I think, um, my job as an elected official is not to make predictions about that. My job is to promote the actions and the policies that will make it possible. I don't think it's responsible for politicians to say, yeah, it's gonna be another two weeks. Yeah, we're gonna do it. And what it's, that's not our job. Our job is to take the actions that will enable all of you to be able to go back to um, your normal lives, to work, to business um, as soon as possible. And I firmly believe that that requires the most rigorous and intense social distancing possible now. The more faithfully we do this now, the more quickly um, we will be able to flatten that curve and get back um, to normal. Um, and then of course that imposes an obligation on public officials to make that economically sustainable for the American people, which is what um, we are trying to do. It's not an either or. Because if we were to say somehow choose the economy, as some people have suggested, over public health, we would end up with neither economy nor public health. Because if we allow that, that um, if we allow this thing to spike so that our healthcare system is completely overwhelmed and we have people pouring out of our hospitals and governments talking about building mass graves in public parks, which is the discussion right now in New York City, we're not gonna have an economy either. So let's flatten the curve of this thing now. Let's be generous with everybody who is suffering economically now so that when we do go back to work, we can do it sustainably and not um, give this monster new life that's going to hurt us even more down the road. Thank you, Tom. Our next question comes from um, a question that was submitted uh, beforehand. What is being done to assist our first responders, such as firefighters, EMTs, police, and hospital staff who cannot maintain a six foot uh, distance? How can we ensure that they don't bring us home? <sighs> Um, that's a tough question. And I've been talking to uh, our mayors and our first responders around the district about what they need. Um, and, you know, what they tell me is that number one ask is to make sure that they have the PPE, the personal protective equipment that they need to not just stay safe themselves, but to be able to, as you suggest, go home and not um, pass this thing to, uh, to their, their loved ones. Um, and, uh, you know, so far, most of the, 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 the towns I've been talking to, they're worried about supplies, but they, 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 um, they've been able to get this far. Um, and with uh, support of the state uh, and donations from uh, from companies and from private individuals. I hate that we have to depend on that, but here we are. Um, most of the towns I'm talking to have told me that, um, that they have what they need for now. Um, so I'm watching that space very, very carefully. Uh, I, I think 
um, but I think we're going to be able to, to get through it. We've also provided money in the CARES Act um, that uh, our police and fire and EMT departments can apply for uh, to pay for all the stuff that they have to buy in some cases to, uh, to keep their, uh, their people safe. And so we're going to be helping uh, all of our departments um, take advantage uh, of that uh, opportunity. Thank you, Tom. Um, our next question comes from the live chat. Are there sources for help? Are there sources for, of help for those who are ages 60 to 65 who live alone if they become ill and need to stay home? Um, hmm. I'd say it's the same sources of help um, uh, that that all of us uh, are uh, relying on. Um, one thing that's incredibly important through uh, this crisis is that everybody have access to health care. Uh, that should go without saying, but of course this is America and so access to health care unfortunately does not go without saying. If you're over 65, you have it through Medicare. If you're under 65, you don't necessarily have it. We, we've asked uh, President Trump, uh, a number of us, uh, 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 including in the New Jersey congressional delegation, uh, to create a special enrollment uh, period for the Affordable Care Act. And so far he has refused uh, to do that. Um, instead, the administration rolled out something that suggested that anybody who needs uh, COVID-related care uh, can get it for free and hospitals will be reimbursed at Medicare rates, which sounds kind of like Medicare for all who have COVID, <laughs> which was a little bit ironic, uh, I, I thought. Um, but this, this crisis is clearly exposing some of the holes in our healthcare system. And one way or another, we need to make sure, and we're working in Congress to make sure um, that, that all of our fellow Americans who are not yet covered by Medicare have the secure knowledge that if they need help right now, um, they can get it and it will be paid for. Thanks, Tom. Our next question comes from Mary Ann from Holland Township. Mary Ann, can you hear us? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi, Tom. Um, I'm considered a gig worker with my business, and I have to apply for New Jersey unemployment and then be denied and then wait for the federal to do whatever it is they're going to do. Um, and I, I know they're trying to work out their end of it on the federal side, but it just seems like it's an unnecessary step to have to go be denied and then apply someplace else again. Is there any way to streamline that? Because like my income is zero. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, you think that's dumb? Uh, of course. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so here's, here's the deal. Uh, the... We, we did this very quickly, necessarily. We wrote this bill in about a week. And then the various federal agencies have had about a week, a uh, little bit more now, to try to figure out how to implement it. And that's created the normal problems you get when a bunch of human beings try to do something complicated. Mm -hmm. um, so the system that, that operated at, at, at first was exactly as you described. Uh, the New Jersey, state of New Jersey authorities that, that manage the unemployment system here did not have guidance from the federal government. So what they said was exactly what you said. Just apply. If you're a gig worker, you have to be denied because traditionally you would be. Um, but we have your information and you will be taken care of once we get the guidelines. So we heard that today they got the guidelines. Literally oh. today. So I don't know exactly what the solution is uh, as of the time of this call, um, but just you know, keep uh, you know, looking at that webpage. Um, and if you've applied already, then you should be good. Uh, if you haven't, then they, there should be a simpler, more um, rational system uh, within the next day or two. Okay. And let us know if you haven't seen that because we'll 
we'll try to figure it out for you. All right, I will. Thank you. Thank you again. Um, just as a reminder, we will try to stay within um, our hour time block. So if you have a last um, couple or last few final questions, please go ahead and send those in to us. And um, again, please put your name, your town, and your email in there. So um, if we don't, we're going to try to get to as many as we can in these last few minutes. But if we can't, we'll definitely have our staff follow up. Um, up next, we have Victoria from Flemington. Hi. Um Thank you so much. Question is regarding the eviction moratorium, and I'm wondering if you could clarify the application. Um, is it only for HUD supported housing and uh, Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loans? Um, who who does it apply to, and and what about the rest of the folks? So, as far as federal policy is concerned, um, it applies to Fannie and Freddie supported loans. Um, because that's what the federal government touches and, and can uh, exercise some uh, power over. Um, the, the governor of New Jersey um, has also um, negotiated some arrangements with lenders that uh, go beyond that. Uh, and I'll let the state, I think, I, I don't want to speak for, for the state precisely based on my sure. version of what that was. Um, but I think it's a, I think there's it, between the federal policy and what Governor Murphy did, uh, I, I think there should be um, a stay of execution for for just about everybody. Uh, remember, I try I, I describe this as a giant timeout in our economy. It's complicated to achieve, but the goal is that that everybody should be able to just sort of stay rest in place. Um, until we uh, until we get through this, and for um, for borrowers, um, you know the the obvious solution is just to tack, you know, hopefully just two or three months of payments to the end of the loan. Um, you still owe that money, but sure, just wait for a few months. Great, thank you. But our staff, you know, if you'd like more detail, our staff can give you a more detailed answer to that question. So, yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you again. Our next question comes from Lisa from Holland Township. Lisa, are you there? I am here. I am. Can you hear me? I can. Yes. Yes. Okay. So my question to you is, um, and thank you very much, Congressman, for doing this talk, but um, do you believe that China should face sanctions due to their failure to advise the world of this epidemic and uh, due to their effort to actually hide the fact that there was human to human transmission? Um, you know, they lied to the uh, World Health Organization. They, you know, tried to misrepresent and, and they really caused the world a whole lot of heartache. Uh, yes. <laughs> Good. Actually. Um... And I, I try to be really precise when I talk about this stuff. Um, and I talk about the government of China, the Communist Party of China, not the people of China, not the nation of China. Um, we have to be very careful about the language that we use because as you know, like that spills over into harassment of Chinese Americans and, and you know uh, Asian Americans more broadly. But absolutely yes, the government of China it's a communist country that suppresses information, that imprisons whistleblowers, that doesn't want to hear bad news. And there was a critical period in which they were suppressing information about this. In fact, they still are because I think the death rate in China has been grossly under, um, understated by the Chinese government. I think a lot more people have died there than they are willing to tell us. And that's important because we need, because they came first, we actually, our scientists need to be able to have good data to be able to estimate the likely direction of this epidemic in the United States. And if we're not getting good data, it's, it's harder. We're relying more on data from Italy than on China because we can't really trust what's coming from, uh, from, from China. So my, my answer to you is yes. Um, I think when we come out of this, you know, my, one of my interests and in my career has been in foreign policy. We need to set up some 
clear rules and expectations um, for how countries cooperate with each other and share information about this stuff going forward. Uh, and that should apply to China. The only thing I would add though, is that, you know, that doesn't absolve us of responsibility in our government because, you know, we did, th there was enough known in January, despite what the Chinese were doing that we should have acted earlier. Right, and you agree then that uh, it was wise though to shut the, um, shut the borders of, of those countries that, you know, had a very high um, infection rate at the beginning in January? Yes, I do. Um, I don't think it was enough. Um, clearly it wasn't enough, um, but it was absolutely the right decision to take, yes. Great. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you. Our next question comes from our uh, questions that were submitted beforehand as well. Um, what additional relief bills are under consideration and how will they affect our local community? Um, thanks. So I, I think I covered some of this. Um, we are looking at, uh, right now we are working on the next relief bill, which may not be the last. Um, and we're looking for additional, more flexible assistance for state and local governments. Um, we will at some point in this or the next bill do something or try to do something big on infrastructure as the pathway to economic uh, recovery. Um, we want to do more on healthcare access, make sure that um, all the promises about uh, COVID treatment being free are kept. Um, uh, and, and, and then just fill some of the holes. Uh, we had a question about college students. Uh, for example, um, there are, you know, because we did this so quickly, there are all kinds of little um, fixes and corrections uh, that we are, uh, that we're going to have to make um, to make this uh, better for people. Thank you, Tom. I will turn it back over to you for closing remarks. Um, any last things you would like to say, Tom? Um, I would just say again, thank you to everybody for uh, participating, for your questions. Uh, we will try again, we will try to get to every single question that I wasn't able to get to uh, live today. Uh, please, please stay in touch with us. Um, if particularly if you are uh, trying to apply for or benefit from any of the relief programs that we have authorized, uh, and you experience uh, any problems or just anything that you think we should know about what's going on out there, please let my office uh, know because that's the only way I can um, have the information I need to make these programs work better and to write that next bill and the one um, that, uh, that comes after that. This is, you know, as I said at the beginning, this is a moment for all of us to come together. There are, there are no Republicans or Democrats in fighting an epidemic. We are all in the same boat. We all need the same things. And thankfully, almost all of us are doing the same thing right now, pulling together, um, trying to beat this epidemic by staying at home and by helping our friends and neighbors in our community. Uh, let's keep doing that. Uh, if we do, I'm confident we're going to come out of this um, and be even stronger as a result. So um, until next time, uh, somebody mentioned we have a small business forum tomorrow uh, where we will have the head of the New Jersey Small Business Administration. Uh, so that, that uh, if you're a small business owner or if you know a small business owner, um, please uh, join us for that because you'll get really uh, good detailed guidance about uh, what can be done to, uh, to help. With that, I'm gonna sign off. Thank you all so much. Stay healthy, stay safe, and stay in touch. Bye-bye.